Hello everybody, my name is Frank Quinn. I am the current Open Mama maintainer and founder of Cascadia Unlimited, uh, where we focus on bridging proprietary and open source technologies. So I'm here to talk to you today about Open Mama um, and about how it is useful for uh, both market data managers and uh, software vendors who are trying to uh, promote their software and their market data solutions into market data managers. So uh, we're going to start off by um, showing a little introduction to Open Mama and um, what it is and where it's used. And then we're going to go into some of the applications for market data managers. And then we're going to move on to some discussion around the applications for uh, market data vendors and for application vendors. And um, then we're going to go into a quick demonstration of uh, consuming using Open Mama from both a proprietary data source and from an open platform data source. Um, and then we're going to finish off with some uh, questions and answers. So we will just dive in here. Uh, so we'll start off by asking the question, what is, what is Open Mama? So for those of you who don't know, um, Open Mama is effectively an abstraction layer. Um, it is the API that your application would write to. Um, but behind that API, it interfaces with the underlying proprietary technologies and open technologies. So an Open Mama application doesn't need to worry about which platform it's publishing onto or which platform it's consuming from. Um, all that an Open Mama application needs to do is subscribe to uh, market data using a configuration transport and um, a bridge, which is usually provided by uh, the platform API. So for example, you can use Open Mama with the exact same application to consume data from uh, one middleware, or you can use it to consume from a completely different middleware and your application doesn't actually change. It's a runtime configuration and you drop in a different library, different configuration file, and then you can start consuming uh, or publishing onto a different market data platform um, without any changes at all to your application. So why is this so important? Well, the main benefit is that your application no longer needs to worry about the underlying technology and supporting lots of different technologies. Um, it means that in terms of choice, the uh, market data manager or the business can, um, for whatever reason, decide to switch between different uh, market data technology providers um, without significant costs and overheads associated with actually making the switch and the development overheads and the support maintenance associated with that. Um, it has flexibility. There's, there's with the same API, you can switch between open source and proprietary technologies. Um, a lot of people are building their own open source based platforms in house at the moment. This will completely support that. Um, the other main advantage is that it can be extended. So there's a, a plugin interface um, for Open Mama that allows you to um, get events fired in whenever um, certain things happen, like subscriptions are created or messages are received. Um, so you can control your audit trail in a standard way as well. Um, we have bindings currently available for C, uh, C++, C Sharp and Java, um, including a recent development, which was C Sharp on .NET Core. So you can use Open Mama with C Sharp on Linux, which is a bit of a big step for us, but uh, it, it seems to work pretty well. So that, that's effectively what Open Mama is for. It provides that abstraction layer away from underlying technologies. So you don't need to be concerned about the underlying uh, platforms that your data is publishing to or subscribing from. And that, that's it, that's all it is. So if you have a look around you as to where it is, and um, where it's deployed. Uh, it was first officially published in 2012. Um, it comes from a long line of non-open source um, APIs which have been in production for decades. So it's very much a mature offering that um, has a lot of production miles behind it. Um, with the nature of the client base involved though, there's not a huge amount of uh, publicly declared people who use it. Um, but there are some out there, and um, the most notable ones include JP Morgan and Deutsche Bank, who are members of the steering committee, and uh, NIFIX, who have recently 
uh, published a zero MQ uh, derived API as well for Open Mama um, to allow Open Mama to publish and subscribe on to um, a completely open source platform. So, the, but there are lots of products out there that build on and integrate with it. We get uh, support requests a lot that come in um, from lots of different customers as well. So, uh, there's a much bigger world out there. Um, and the integrations that we provide, or the integrations that are provided by the community, um, extend into wider technologies and wider platforms. And, and it's not uncommon to use Open Mama purely as an abstraction layer to get data into a larger platform from perhaps a more niche provider um, that they may not want to, or a market data manager may not want to uh, go to the effort of writing an API for there either. And um, the other thing worth noting is that it's used across, it's used across all asset classes, um, FX, options, futures, derivatives, they're all um, in use with Open Mama to varying degrees. It traditionally comes from the equity side, but it does have an awful lot of um, use outside of that and in uh, different, different asset classes as well. So if we take a look inside the mindset of the uh, market data manager and the problems and challenges that are facing them, um, there, there's always new functional pressures. There's always something that somebody wants. Uh, there's a new market data provider. There's a new way that they want to access historical data. And there'll always be something that comes in um, and EDCs for in-house speed handlers. It's a very, very busy job being a market data manager. Um, and the general um, biggest recurring theme is that they need to continually support a variety of different little snowflake applications and platforms, uh, which all need to play nicely with each other. Um, against the backdrop of this, you have all the performance constraints that go with that. So you've got um, low latency, but you need to also support high bandwidth. Uh, you need to, uh, the data needs to be very well normalized, it needs to look the same across different data sources. There's usually lots of tweaks required from the third party providers to try and get it to behave like that. And it's basically a constant struggle to try and get things to look in a sort of regular way that uh, is easier to manage and easier to maintain. On top of this, it tends to be one of the biggest cost centers that's um, in, in where they're deployed. So you have uh, constant cost efficiency problems. They, they want to reduce footprint. Uh, they want to uh, reuse data that they've paid for once. Uh, they want to make sure that the same data is reused elsewhere if they can and if the license allows them to. Um, on top of that, you've got the regulatory requirements that come in from the side. Um, so the, the result of all this is that uh, market data managers generally don't build everything themselves. There will be a number of open source, proprietary, uh, quite niche, uh, in-house uh, technologies, and they all need to play nicely with each other. And um, that's that's really the, the, the challenge that they're facing today, um, trying to get all those to rein in and, and play nicely together. So uh, we're, we're going to walk through, this is a, a very simplified uh, version of what a, a platform would look like. Um, but the main uh, thing that you need to take away from this is that the, the technologies here are effectively isolated. Um, if you've got a market data vendor A there who is uh, publishing data onto their platform, uh, there may also be an in-house messaging platform, uh, which may have been written or may have been maintained for previous reasons and has been too costly to move away from. Um, or it has its own advantages uh, to unique use case for the target deployment, um, and that can't disappear either. Um, so you end up having these uh, redistribution layers to try and uh, attempt to make sense of them and to try to publish data onto multiple data sources or to switch data sources or data platforms. So the requirement is that the API um, that we have here is deployed across all applications that need to consume from that platform. Um, and it's not just messaging either, there's entitlements, there's compliance, logging, um, there's drop copies, there's lots of things that need to be done um, outside of purely the market data stream. And that's where the, the plugin interface that I was talking about earlier on can come into play with OpenMAM and to try to put those across in a standardized way. Um, but the applications, because their APIs are writing to um, these platforms directly, 
they're effectively locked in to the underlying vendors. And this is a very simplified diagram where we have like, you know, one uh, application trading box there. But in the real world, there could be tens, hundreds, thousands of those deployed, and each of which are locked into the underlying uh, technology vendor directly, where they're written directly to that API. Um, and of course, the alternative to this is that uh, the market data managers applications um, abstract themselves from the underlying API. But then, of course, you've effectively got an API that does what OpenMama does, deployed and maintained in-house without putting resource, without everything that, that comes associated with OpenMama. Um, so the, the main takeaway from this is that whenever new technologies come along, uh, whenever technologies go out of fashion, um, the, the cost of migrating to a new platform is quite high uh, because the APIs that are being used by each of these other applications there's just so many of them, it's uh, very difficult to switch them. So you end up picking third parties and um, technologies based on, okay, what's gonna, what's gonna not make my life a misery whenever I go to deploy this, as opposed to what is actually the best product to solve the problem that I'm facing at the minute. So that, that's what the, what's what the market data platform looks like at the moment whenever um, there's no open model involved anywhere. So what happens whenever you do involve OpenMama? Now, the, the main takeaway here is that um, OpenMama doesn't, isn't a platform. Um, I think in a lot of uh, things that you may have seen in the past, uh, OpenMama has been very much portrayed as a platform. It's not, it's an abstraction layer away from um, an underlying platform. So there's nothing to stop um, an OpenMama application uh, publishing and subscribing onto uh, one vendor messaging platform or an in-house messaging platform or an in-house um, entitlement tracking system or a compliance logger. There's nothing to stop any of that. Um, OpenMama is really just an API. It's a standard way to try and handle market data events. So it doesn't need to be used everywhere. And that's why purposefully in this diagram, you see the little boxes at the bottom. Um, you don't need to do it in all applications. You don't need to do it even everywhere in the same application. Um, you can just be used where it's appropriate uh, to try and reduce the overhead associated with maintaining support for each of these third-party platforms because the OpenMama API itself is uh, very stable. Um, it's been, I don't think there has been any application uh, interface changes um, since its launch. So the, the, this means that the, the, the OpenMama API can be used to trigger events in certain ways. It can be used to access data in the same way um, and it can be used for both subscribing and publishing. Um, it can effectively be used in place of uh, a traditional feed handler um, to try and get data from uh, a data source, uh, a direct data source, and get it out into another platform elsewhere. Um, or it can be used uh, fairly piecemeal and just use it for connecting to an individual platform. But the, the main takeaway is that the underlying technology doesn't have to change. There's no major upheaval of underlying tech that you need to change. And if you do, then please let us know because that is that is not the goal of OpenMama. Uh, OpenMama is supposed to be pretty passive in the underlying platforms and it's supposed to operate alongside it as opposed to uh, pushing its opinions onto it. So if we move away from the market data managers just for a moment to um, discuss uh, the application, the market data vendors who are trying to target these platforms. Um, there, there's generally uh, the opposite problem uh, involved there in that platform migrations for them are very difficult uh, because the every customer's target platform is different and everybody's requirements are different. Um, and if you want to introduce a new API, um, that's a significant cost, a significant risk associated with uh, the market data manager whenever they look at it. So a market data vendor can't just go into a market data manager and say, you know, we, we want to replace your entire platform. And they may have a platform, which they may want the uh, market data manager to use, but they don't want it to be a core entry to requirement because it just lights up um, red lights in the uh, market data manager whenever they see this coming on. Because um, it's 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 a dangerous thing to try and add another new platform or farm, as they 
uh, could often get known uh, to try and handle another market data platform uh, provider um, who wants to get their data onto your platform. So what, what happens if a market data vendor wants to target a non-open mama application? So the first thing you notice is that they, that non-open mama application probably already has other APIs. Uh, they might not be for uh, market data, or they might be for market data, um, but they're, they're going to be there. They're, there's already a cost of uh, development associated with maintaining whatever it's already doing. So uh, with, without Open Mama, you're effectively introducing a new one. Um, you're, adding, you're expecting the client to uh, write to your application code. I mean, it's great that you've got an API that makes it easy to consume from the uh, market data that you're providing, or maybe you've got a protocol specification that you're providing instead. Um, but the expectation is still going to be on the customer to understand that API and to write their application to it. And part of the difficulty with opportunity cost as it goes down the um, down the timeline is that what, what might seem initially as quite a compelling prospect uh, because you're only targeting a single application uh, during a POC phase. Um, and you know, you're receiving the market data and it's fine. Uh, whenever it starts to roll out to a pilot and you start to uh, try and target a real world application or a cluster of applications, um, it becomes increasingly complicated. And then suddenly whenever it's deployed across uh, the enterprise or hundreds of applications, the, the adoption cost increases with time and the complexity increases with time and the expectation and the burden on the customer increases with time. And the result of that is that the net value of the proposition that you're proposing is actually reduced because the customer needs to factor in the price of um, migrating all these applications to the market data provider. And because of that, um, there's not an awful lot of volatility in terms of technology used in the application space. So what happens whenever it's switched around and then open mama compatible apps are targeted? Or as an alternative, um, Open Mama is the chosen API that um, you tell clients to use whenever they're switching market data uh, providers. So the, the core takeaway is that the client code doesn't change. If you're consuming from an Open Mama data source coming down from Transport A um, and you're moving to effectively Transport B, Bridge B, um, the, the client software doesn't change. It doesn't even recompile. Um, it's just a different configuration and a different runtime library dropped in. Uh, so it means that the, it does shift a bit of the expectation um, onto the vendor to develop the bridge for Open Mama, but that's only developed once. And once it's developed, um, in our experience anyway, there's very little maintenance associated with it, particularly compared with an in-house API where you've got uh, client opinions to contend with. And, uh, what effectively happens is that the adoption cost for clients is reduced because it's not being duplicated across every application that they have. Um, and in the event that they don't have Open Mama yet, and you're introducing Open Mama as the core API that you're suggesting that they use, uh, that's a much more compelling story for a customer to get on board with because they know, oh, okay, so if I consume data from you and I decide to change my mind at a later point, I'm no longer stuck to your platform. I don't have to go through this massive migration cost um, to try and move to yet another market data provider. So the risk is much lower there as well. Um, and as well as that, the, the ongoing development cost, which is, which is often overlooked for um, this from a client's point of view, um, is much lower as well. Um, and the support for the API that the client is writing to comes from the community. It comes from the Open Mama community. It doesn't necessarily go straight to the, the vendor unless there's a bug in the underlying um, vendor software. So that, that's the main value proposition from a market data vendor and an application vendor's point of view. Um, it's worth noting as well that um, we've discussed market data providers here, but the same thing applies to um, any application that's perhaps even consuming from different market data platforms and um, things like tech capture platforms and um, technologies like that can all uh, benefit from using Open Mama uh, to try and abstract itself away from uh, the underlying technology that's that's in use. So whenever you break it down, um, 
Open Mama really is all about choice and neutrality. It's not an all-encompassing platform that's going to come in and uh, expect it to make massive changes in your deployment. Um, it's, it, its main core value from the start has always been that uh, the selection of a market data vendor or an application vendor should be based on how good it is and how high of quality it is and how low the latency is. It shouldn't be based on how sticky their API is or how inconvenient it is to choose anyone other than whatever incumbent is currently present on your platform. Um, it also breaks down the silos between the platforms. It means that you can bridge between different technologies if you want to. Um, you can migrate um, slowly away from other platforms if needs be, um, without having to worry about going big bang and using open Mama everywhere. Um, and if you don't want to use it everywhere, that's absolutely 100% fine. Um, that's what it's for. It will consume and produce onto different platforms as and when required. Um, it could even be used in those as an extraction layer for direct exchanges, should it needs to be. Um, and the applications, if you're a market data uh, application provider, um, you can just benefit from connectivity to every OpenMama supported platform simply by writing to OpenMama instead of directly to the third party platform APIs um, themselves. And there's a reduced risk for the customer. Um, and there's nothing to stop in-house technologies from moving to OpenMama as well. The Bridge API is open. The OpenMama community will support you in creating new bridges should it be required. And there's actually been a lot of effort made in the last uh, year to reduce the complexity that's required in building your own bridge. So it's much easier to build an OpenMama bridge than it has ever been. And because the OpenMama API is public and it's free and it's open source and it can be contributed to, uh, there's nothing to stop um, application uh, development being outsourced with a nice firm specification. Um, the API is public, there is no licensing associated with using it, so there's nothing to stop um, external parties from writing their own uh, software for it. Okay, so we're going to switch over here to a um, MAMA uh, demo here. Uh, we did pre-record it because uh, we needed to record it during market hours over here. Um, so we're going to demonstrate the uh, OpenMama portable demo environment and uh, switching between open source and proprietary uh, technologies, the proprietary technology being uh, Bella's Superfeed product uh, without any recomp recompilation and uh, a simple reconfiguration and a new library install. Okay, so we're going to show a demo here of uh, what we call the OpenMama portable demo environment. Now we do have some documentation about this on our website. Um, the default format that we have here is as an AWS AMI. Um, you're welcome to extend this. Uh, we use the official CentOS images, which means that you can extend them uh, without any licensing fears. And we have um, instructions there for how to build your own if you want to build it with a uh, Vagrant or if you want to set up a demo environment on a bare metal box. So in the instance that we have here, we have an AWS AMI that is already set up with a base image um, and we're just going to log into it here now. So the first thing that you see is that um, it uh, tells you that OpenMama is installed to opt OpenMama. Um, it has the Cupid bridge by default and uh, the binaries are all in the path. So one of the binaries with OpenMama includes Mama Listen C, uh, which is a test utility that um, allows you to connect to an OpenMama data source and uh, print some data out from it. So um, we're going to just go ahead and run it here. The source is uh, OM. The uh, middleware bridge, which is the pluggable bridges that we were talking about, is Cupid in this instance. Uh, the transport name is sub, and we have an Eisen currency mix symbol there. So if we run this up, we can see the uh, instrument starts ticking. Uh, we can see some data coming out of that, which is great. Now that is connecting to a capture daemon, which is running the capture replay daemon, which is running locally, and uh, that's that's effectively what we're connecting to. There is no external market data source involved here. Now that's great, uh, but what if we did want to include an external market data source? Uh, well, we do have a. Um, a repository that third parties are free to contribute to, uh, which will give access to optional additional bridges that people can add as and when they see fit. So uh, we have OpenMama Superfeed. 
which was contributed by Bella. Uh, so if we install that and have a look in OptopenMama uh, lib, uh, we can see that some of the middleware bridges that if you were familiar with uh, Bella, you would have seen before, uh, will be available on the um, LD library path there for OpenMama to use. So and if we want to get the same OpenMama command that we had before, from listen C, um, they provided us with an uh, alternative source name. And the middleware here is their data fabric middleware. And the transport is delay data, which I'm just copying and pasting from another window here. And the symbol name is another rising currency mic in this format which is here. Now, that's not going to work yet because we haven't configured the uh, configuration, the moment of properties, to point to the new data source. So bridges can pull in configuration from the standard open mama uh, transport list to find out how to connect to the upstream data sources. So we have the configuration that was supplied by, ba or supplied by Bella um, added here. So we'll add those in and uh, try the command again. And you can see some data starting to tick in from the uh, Superfeed uh, delayed data source that they've provided us with. So that's what's involved with getting the same application to connect to multiple uh, different data sources without any uh, recompilation. It's just a different library getting loaded which is uh, open at runtime and a uh, different configuration. So if we go in then to the, uh, every demo kit that we have has a checkout of OpenMama's code installment as well. Um, so we'll just go into the uh, C++ tutorials that we've got here. So that's an example um, uh, quick start app that we've got um, in our demo to show you um, how to get acquainted with OpenMama. There are um, versions available for C, C++, C Sharp, and Java. The C Sharp one will actually run on .NET Core as well, so you can run it on Linux. So if we create a little directory here, as is the standard for CMake, and we'll do a quick build. This is a brand new application which doesn't know anything about um, Bella or um, any other, it doesn't know anything about Cupid either, it was built against OpenMama and OpenMama then decides which libraries to um, load. So we will go ahead and um, run this little quick start application. Oops, I have to build it first. Run this little quick start application and provide the same commands as uh, what's provided to connect to Superfeed with the data. And we can see we're starting to tick there in our little example application too. So uh, that's a quick introduction to OpenMama and how we can switch between different data sources uh, without any uh, recompilation uh, being required or any code changes required in the app. Okay, so that concludes our presentation on OpenMama. Um, thanks everyone for their time. Uh, we've provided some resources here to um, let you follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn if you like. Um, you can send us uh, an email on the mailing list if you want to get some extensive support. And uh, we're also available on Gitter if anyone wants to have a chat with us or at least some have some high level discussions around um, how you'd like to use OpenMama in your organization. So thanks again and uh, we'll leave it to the Q&A.